Hi, I'm Tom Stevenson, and welcome to Lecture 8B of our Residential Technology course. And in this lecture, we're going to be looking at insulation types. Uh, the previous lecture, we really dug deep into the building envelope and some of the basis for uh, building science principles, uh, which ties in. And of course, it's going to tie into insulation types as we describe them. But as usual, I don't like to make any one video too long. Uh, so that's one way of doing it. Uh, they really are integrated together. Uh, so we'll look at the different types of insulation, this, their properties. We kind of talked about our values in the last session. There's that table. Uh, and this is ba all based on chapter 12 in your textbook, Understanding Construction Drawings. So make sure you can refer to that. Um, identify the various uh, hatchings we see on drawings, how to interpret it. Uh, ventilation requirements. We kind of went over that in 8C, the next uh, succeeding lecture on where this stuff is on the drawings and uh, the 1 to 300, uh, one square foot of ceiling for um, 300, 300, 1 to 300, one square foot of ventilation for every 300 square feet of uh, ceiling space, insulated ceiling space, uh, which is from the Ontario Building Code. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, caulks and sealants too, which helps to seal up our um, joints and uh, prevent water infiltration. So um, when we think about insulation materials, you know what, there's a lot of different types of insulation materials out on the market and it can get quite confusing uh, as to which uh, is the best choice for the best circumstances. Heck, I can get confused myself sometimes uh, when you're deciding on an insulation type, even in a basement insulation and things of that nature. Um, so uh, is it, you have to ask some questions, you know, is it going to be exposed to moisture? Some insulations are fine if they get wet, like an extruded polystyrene. It can be used on the exterior of a foundation wall and there's going to be no problems. Um, so is it resistant to moisture flow? Uh, if it's um, a cellulose, uh, like a paper-based uh, blown in insulation, not too good if it gets wet. Uh, even fiberglass, not too good if it gets wet. It compresses, it loses its R value. Uh, does it resist air movement? Um, does it act as a uh, air barrier? Um, can it act as an air barrier? Can it act as a vapor barrier? Different materials and insulations have different properties. Uh, is it, does it require a fire protected covering like some of the rock wool or rock sole products, uh, uh, which are very fireproof. Um, is it easy to install? How difficult under the particular application? Is it cost effective? There's quite a variance in price with insulations. And sometimes you really want to use a certain insulation, but then maybe it's price prohibited based on your budgetary requirements. Um, so is it uh, cost effective and does it take up a lot of space? So what's the R value per inch? You know, in a large urban center, New York City, um, Vancouver, Los Angeles, Toronto, uh, where, where we are, um, very expensive space. So if you're taking a lot of inches off the room size in a basement or a room size in uh, uh, upstairs, that's a problem, right? So. Um, because every square inch costs money. So we're, you're probably better not to have something that's going to require a, a large thickness because it has a low R value per inch. So these are questions that usually sort of lead to some of the results. You can think of insulation types as being bats or blankets. So they're friction fit and they squeeze between something like a set of studs or joists. Loose fill that it's just so, sort of blown in and it sort of just fluffs up and it sits like in an attic situation. Rigid or, sem, rigid or semi rigid boards, which may go as a cladding outside a wall system. Uh, foamed in place, very, very popular uh, spray foams, uh, but also very expensive. So that can be uh, limiting on its um, use, but those are how we could classify them. And if we think of bat or blanket, it kind of comes in lengths or in bats. We call them bats, these little sections here. And you can quickly lay them down or squeeze them between. So you can have them pre-cut. They call it friction fit. That it would fit between a 16-inch uh, stud opening, a 24-inch um, uh, opening, a 12-inch opening. You can buy them pre-cut and they just squeeze into place. So that's bat or blanket. Usually you're looking at something like a rock sole material 
which is like made out of a volcanic rock that is sort of sterated and sort of into fibers uh, or a glass fiber uh, situation. So like Fiberglass Canada makes uh, fiberglass, uh, Roxel or Rock Wool Company, I think as they're changing their name now, um, makes uh, the, um, the material that's made out of volcanic rock. Uh, this is a very fireproof material and it's pretty good under moisture. This one's not so good under moisture and it melts under fire. It's not like it spreads a fire, but it kind of just melts. Uh, so um, different materials. Uh, this, both of them, you know, if you're installing them, you need to have proper masks and um, gloves and that sort of thing. Fiberglass is notorious for being itchy if you install it because uh, little glass fibers, they get in your skin and they, they make you want to scratch. Uh, so you definitely don't want to be breathing this stuff um, in uh, when you're installing them. Uh, but uh, they do give a, a pretty good R value at a reasonable price. And um, so there's those advantages. I would say this is probably easier to install and this is probably more resilient when it comes to moisture and fire and those types of things. So you got got pluses and minuses like this is easy to cut. Sometimes cutting it with like a bread knife or something like that makes it pretty easy. Uh, so... Um, yeah, and some some of uh, the products are non-flammable, as I mentioned. Usually around R three and a half per inch, but as I, I think I said in my other lecture, the technology seems to be changing. The R value per inch seems to be going up, so you got to look at the product specifically. And R value is a good guide to see what what the R value is of a particular uh, material. They don't act as a an a, uh, air or vapor barrier, so you know wind would blow through it. Um, uh, vapor would go through it fairly readily but that's fine you just you know we you use an air and a vapor barrier as we described in the previous lecture um, so that's no problem under the right situation um, and it's probably the, they're probably the among the most popular installations because they're very cost-effective loose fill that can be blown in you can get practically any kind of material that it can be um, blown in um, uh, cellulose, like a paper-based material, fiberglass chunks can be blown in. Uh, I've even seen recycled jeans, uh, so like, yeah, denim jeans, uh, recycling them chopped up into shreds, uh, having that blown in act as a, a insulation. So there are a lot of different uh, materials. It's basically somebody's in a truck down below that's got a big sort of blower in it and somebody's dumping bags and somebody's up in the attic. This is usually run up through the attic access hole through a window and somebody's just blowing it in, filling it all up. And this is pretty, pretty easy. You could get this up to, you know, um, if you had like uh, 18 inches, that's probably going to give you around um, close to R60. Uh, so I think on the updated Doncaster drawings in the attic, it's showing like R60. Uh, I think the Brook drawings are showing like R50. Building codes have uh, recently changed, so I, I'm not sure that R50 even makes the current code, but R60 does. Um, and uh, this is just baffles that is allowing air to flow from the soffits uh, up through. So if you had a ventilated soffit, like most of the drawings that we're using, because it's nice, even airflow from the soffits up, there's probably going to be roof vents up somewhere out of this picture. So the air flows into the attic and flows out the roof vents. You got air flowing over. In case there's any um, moisture leakage and any condensation in the attic, it dries out. You design it to dry out. Uh, building science is all about trying to figure out how things behave and understanding how it behaves. And not that you can totally change how it behaves, but you can build so it doesn't cause a problem and having the proper amount of ventilation in your attic is one way so that's what these baffles are in place sometimes in, in construction sites we just put a two by two and we cut a piece of wafer board that allows the air to blow in so you've got like an inch and a half clear blowing up through um, these members now the total ventilation again only needs to add up to the one to three hundred one three hundreds of uh, ceiling area that's insulated. So if you've got a thousand square feet, you've got like three and a third square feet. Half should come from the soffit, half should come from the roof vent. So maybe this has a little bit extra than is normally needed. Usually they'll, they'll block up and they'll do like every second or third one as long as the area is going to satisfy the ventilation requirements. By the way, you could have more ventilation than the minimum, right? Um, the one to 300 is a minimum, remember building code. Anything less than the minimum or supersedes what the requirement is, 
is illegal. It's not like it's the best. Uh, cell cellulose fiber, glass fiber, mineral wool, and as I said, I've even seen things like jeans and other things. As long as it's been tested and it's certified that it carries a certain R value, um, that's a reasonable expectation. Uh, rigid board insulation. So here we've got, it took me a while to learn this, but expanded polystyrene. So there's extruded polystyrene and there's expanded polystyrene. This kind of looks like your co old time coffee cups. There's little cells to it. Um, and uh, it gives a little bit less R value. It gives about an R three and a half, something like that per inch, might be R 3.2 or 3.7, <clears throat> depending on the product. Uh, compared to ex extruded, which is like the blue, a little bit denser styrofoam, or the code board, like Owens uh, Konings code board, Dow's blue, um, styrofoam SM. Different manufacturers have different materials. What you're looking for is it's certified and it has a certain R value, and that gives you a comparable. This is not really good um, for uh, in ground applications. Um, it breaks down with sun most of the styrofoams break down if they get too much sunlight, UV rays on them. As long as they're covered over, that's fine. Uh, but this is really good on exteriors of buildings. It can be clad that's going to be covered over with something like an EF system. EFs, uh, exterior insulated finish systems like this because they can rasp it. So if there's a little bit of humps and bumps, they run this big rasp over it. It's like a giant file and it looks like it's snowing in the summer if you do that. Uh, and it'll smooth it out and make it nice and straight so that when the um, person that's um, applying the EFs, um, various, the synthetic stucco material over the fiberglass mesh, um, they can trail it on nice and smooth and it looks nice and flat. Um, so, uh, but you don't see it as much as you see the extruded because of the higher R value in the um, extruded polystyrene. So that's the expanded. You can also get glass fiber boards, like fiberglass boards that are semi-rigid. They're not hard, but they're reasonably dense. Like they're, they're semi-rigid, not as um, rigid as say styrofoam. I used to use that a lot on the exterior of walls. I haven't seen it used as much um, as of lately. Um, so now you got your styrofoam, like I was saying, your extruded polystyrene, uh, very, very popular. I'm not trying to promote anybody. This is Dow's, Owens Corning's. They've got a similar product, um, same idea, same R value, just different, different manufacturers and different colors. So color is not the only indicator. Enjoy my coffee here. So we have... Um, Styrofoam, and you can have it in a lot of applications. You can have it on the exterior of a, of a basement. Uh, you can have it on the interior of a basement. There's lots of different products. They have tongue and, like not tongue and groove, but ship lapped. They have ones that have a groove cut out of it, so you could nail strapping between it, all kinds of different um, products and examples. So it's a, it's a pretty good material for a lot of differing um, purposes. You definitely wouldn't want to put it on a roof like this, unless the roof was like a cathedral ceiling. Like you wouldn't want to have a ceiling and then an attic and then this on top. So I just want to make sure um, we're clear on that. Um, if it's a cathedral ceiling, something of this nature, where it's like a church kind of ceiling going up, you could have it on the inside, you could have it on the outside. You got to watch the designs for that. You got proper ventilation where the air vapor barriers working out with that. So there's a bit of building science thinking to do on that. Um, but you definitely wouldn't put this like, say, on one of our drawings, like the Doncaster or Brook drawings. You would never put that on that way for that. But if it was a cathedral ceiling, um, you could design it that it would be um, placed in there that way, perhaps. Perhaps. Uh, so styrofoam wall mate. Again, that's got so the cutouts in it so you can put the strapping over top of it. Just a different way of doing it. Um, waterproof. Um, um, yeah, can be. But it needs. this is a very good point here must be covered with a fireproof material such as drywall. So you wouldn't do this in a basement and leave it. You do it in a basement and cover it with drywall. It's not that it, it's not that it catches fire like crazy, but the fumes, if it catches fire, are very toxic. Um, so you want to make sure that if, the, if it catches fire for some reason, people have had plenty of time to leave the building. So the fire alarm's gone off, they've gotten out. It's burnt, whatever is on fire is finally going through the drywall, which is a, um, giving you a fireproof material over top of it. And then it would be, give the toxic fumes. So um, from that purpose, it just means it's got to be covered 
um, that way. Same would go with the expanded polystyrene. Um, spray polyurethane foam. Uh, so basically spray foam is put into place. It's, it's used, well, this kind of usage where you can spray and you can fill up all kinds of gaps. You can get canisters that you can do it at like Home Depot. Have gaps around windows, gap fillers, different types. Some are for big openings, some are for narrow openings. Very good that it'll fill all those gaps. But we can also do it for wall systems, polyurethane foam. So we can do it for whole wall systems and ceiling systems. Much more expensive, but really good. Uh, very often used for the ceiling over garages. You might have bedrooms up above on the second floor, ceilings over garages. If you look at the brook drawings, you'll see it in the garage. You'll see it over the little side entry when it's using that option. Um, there's a bunch of different um, applications that you'll see it used in. So uh, it gives you reasonable R value. It depends on the strength of it, like if it's half pound or two pounds. So there's differing types. This is where it's been screeded off. And then you can see how it fill all those voids between the joists, which are very difficult to fill. That's really helpful for um, sealing all those joints that way. Um, so uh, the job mixture, again, it's differing products. Half, there's, and there's all kinds of differing products. So I don't want to limit to just this, but just to give you an idea, um, half pound would give you similar to like a fiberglass uh, material or a rock sole material per inch. And then you're really getting up into the high R values, even better than the extruded polystyrene. One of the things I've seen in research study is whether that R value holds up like 10 years down the road, what's the R value in it? So it drops a bit uh, in some cases. So you might not fully achieve the R6 on the same material five, 10 years down the road. So that's a question that um, I'll leave for uh, you know, future issues uh, as far as longevity and how long it stays um, nicely tightly sealed and is there any shrinkage issues and things of that nature over time uh, but generally it's been a very popular product over the last 15 years I would say so over the last 15 years it's gained a lot of um, use because it does tightly seal and it is an effective way of getting high R value uh, per inch and especially like all around everybody for everything uses um, to spray around um, joints and things of that nature um, to get that um, purpose. So here you see this is in a stacked condominium situation where it's been um, put in and these are metal studs and it's been used on that um, to um, give higher values and seal all the joints um, very, very well uh, in this particular case. Um, ventilation, so I've been talking about ventilation. I'm not quite sure that everybody understands what I mean. So a roof vent, you see it. These things that are sticking up on the roof, uh, they ventilate. So there's a hole underneath here that is left. It's cut and then this is placed over it and then the shingles are placed around it. So this is a typical roof vent. This is what we call a ridge vent. So it's actually like a plastic um, uh, material that's got like grills in it. You can sort of see the little uh, the little grills along here and that would allow air to flow into the attic so there's a little bit of a cutout in the plywood below this so that air can flow into the attic and air can flow through the soffit vents out and out through the ridge vent remember warm air rises so if that's the case it might move like that uh, pick up moisture that's gathering in the attic to make sure that it seals um, properly so it's kind of you've got this uh, uh, perforated soffit and earlier parts of the textbook, I've got some pictures of the soffit in there with the little holes in it. And the air flows in through that baffle. I showed you that baffle a few slides back, those black strips that they had, those baffles. And that allows air to um, flow up into the attic. This is showing like bad insulation in the attic in this example with that hatching, bad insulation here with that hatching. And that's your airflow. You want to make sure that you've got that airflow. And that's that 1 to 300 ventilation. So um, 900 square feet would require 3 square feet of ventilation. Balanced 50-50 between the soffit and the roof. Another detail, a section detail showing you the brick, showing you the airspace. That also means that air gets to flow in this airspace and up and ventilate and dry out the airspace too. Because remember, there's weep holes in the bottom of the brick remember those little spaces those weep holes and that air would flow up and it would basically be able to um, ventilate itself out or up through here so any excess moisture can be taken out of the 
um, airspace as well. Uh, so here we've got um, that baffle that we were just looking at kind of shows it here. Not exactly the same. One of the things is that you didn't really see too clearly in those pictures is the baffle would be bent around and fastened here some way or something would be, sometimes they'll just use bats of insulation to fill up this space. Because if you're using blown in, in insulation, you don't want to blow it in and have it all fill up in the soffit, right? So you got to get this blocked off so that when you blow in the insulation, it doesn't fill up the soffits because then the soffits wouldn't be able to be ventilated so um, keeping that in mind that's why you want to make that that clear space and then this to be blocked off so here what they did was they they bent over bad insulation and they blocked them all off in these spaces here and if it's a raised heel roof truss you need a bigger um, piece to be rolled up and to block that and then every uh, probably about every four feet they put in a ventilation baffle and so this will stay clear and this is that not the one that you saw in the previous video with the sort of the preformed black um, baffle this is using a plywood or w -O -S -W -O -S -B, um baffle to allow the air to flow up you notice these little uh, this strip of wood with the little blocks well, that's so they can nail a freeze board on afterwards. See, the brick is laid across the top here. If you nail anything to that brick, it's just going to come loose. But if you put the brick between these blocks of wood, um, then uh, you've got something to nail the freeze board on afterwards. So they've got that all planned out in this particular case. These straps you see here, that's for the fall arrest systems when the workers are working so they can tie themselves off and work safely. Somebody will c come around and cut that uh, off when they're putting on the fascia and soffit later on. So I think we're fairly familiar with the, these section details. We've been looking at them in some of the other videos like 5C and um, previous videos that I've done on this, Lecture 5C in case you're interested. Uh, and these are section details, but you notice the hatching. So this is showing styrofoam against the wall, and then this would be built out with a stud wall and this is showing bad insulation so that's the hatching for bad insulation it's showing bad insulation in the attic at least the hatching is but it could usually to be honest we don't use bad insulation in the attic it's easier to just blow it in and you can get the to get the kind of r values you need for code requirements it's so much easier to just blow it in so i, I don't rationalize why anybody would typically use bats in an attic unless you're just doing it yourself and you had lots of access to bats and you didn't have the equipment to blow it in. But other than that, I can't rationalize why you would do that. Um, and even sometimes to save money, they'll do a, a flash insulation where they'll put a, a foam insulation first and then they'll blow in insulation above it because the foam will seal all the joints and everything. Um, just different ways of approaching it. But generally, it's just bad insulation, maybe about 15, 16, 16 inches um, thick or more of uh, blown in insulation. So yeah, we've got our roof ventilation one to 300 of the insulated uniformly distributed. You can see the ventilated soffit, vented soffit where the air can blow up in over top. You'd have roof vents up here um, somewhere uh, in that place. Here they even, you can see the hatching. They've got a styrofoam in there and they've got a bad insulation. So they're really going to town with this. Header wrap air barrier around continuous header joist with RSI rigid insulation and RSI, and it's giving you the numbers, bat or foam insulation. So, um, and the header wrap, you remember, we looked at in the previous uh, lecture. And so that's acting as an air barrier around here. And it would tie to the air vapor barrier here. Uh, going around. It has to be continuous when it's an air barrier, right? Um, so this is acting in both um, parts here. So that's why it says continuous air and vapor barrier. Remember, we could have a vapor barrier on the outside, but we would have to seal it to the inside to make it continuous. So that's really just showing the same thing up close, but just get a look at it, read through these different elements, make sure that it makes sense to you. These are very good, well done details um, by um, Toronto Chief Area Building Officials Committee. Um, so it's definitely worth a good look through. Uh, here we've got stuff we studied earlier, the drainage layer, there's the weeping tile. That's gonna tie into the drainage system. 
Uh, this would be really uh, water suitable for storm water. It would need to be in the sanitary system when you have two systems. We already talked about that in previous lectures. This is with the uh, brick veneer. Um, this one, of course, was, was with just siding on the outside. Same idea, just you've got the airspace. Remember I said it could vent through the weep holes and out through the top in the soffit. Uh, so that was that previous image picture that we saw, I think, back here. Right, so you can see the brick coming up through here. Ventilate it out and same details. And remember, that's a hatching for styrofoam. That's a hatching for bat insulation. Close up. And there's our drainage layer. Stops hydrostatic pressure build up against the wall. Any extra excess moisture comes down and it's taken away by the weeping tile. So um, when we think about green building too, a, a few things I wanted to, we capped off uh, the last uh, lecture, I think it was 7B with um, green building when we talked about building systems. So I just wanted to bring this in because really, why are we putting so much insulation? Why are we trying to seal up our buildings with a tight envelope? Well, we're doing it because one, we wanna lower the carbon footprint. We wanna use less energy. We want to be good, um, citizens um, climate wise and climate change is happening uh, so we need to be able to uh, fundamentally uh, make our buildings uh, more uh, sustainable and so if we can do things above the building code minimum uh, that's what we would call green building uh, and if we can go the full nine yards then it's sustainable when we're going to net zero uh, like the certifications through the Canadian Home Building Association with net zero certification. You might want to look that one up. Uh, so we, one of the least expensive ways to do it is to increase the air tightness in the envelope with the air barrier and increase the insulation R values in the walls and the ceilings when we build. It's very inexpensive to do it when we're building new. It's very expensive to do it after the fact. You've got your finishes on and all those things. How do you, how do you increase the R value? Not easy. But when you put it into the process, very easy. And some of this stuff that, you know, the, the envelope's not been sealed very well, it's just, in my mind, carelessness by the trades that are involved and carelessness by the uh, management team that's involved because it's, to at least have a tight envelope, it's not crazy difficult when you know what you're doing. It's that aspect of mastering your craft and getting better and better at it and coordinating the trades properly and having processes and systems that help you to reach the goals that you're trying to achieve. Um, so it's important from that perspective. And one of the things that we need to do when we are dealing with um, uh, sealing up the envelope though is we want to make sure that uh, we have good indoor air quality and so just going back you know we want to have um, means and methods to ensure that we have good indoor air quality because sealing it up inside that's not necessarily a good thing either from that perspective we want to make sure that we have fresh air coming into the building but we want to do it efficiently so we have what we call an HRV. There's also ERVs, and the difference is really one manages the humidity levels as well. Um, but the HRV, um, in simple terms, it takes uh, fresh air from outside. And that might be cold. In the wintertime, it's going to be cold. Uh, not in the summer, but in the winter. So it takes fresh air from outside. And we said, building science principle, warm moves to cold. Well, that cold air is passing by stale warm air from inside and there's a bunch of fins that are in the hrv and those little fins like metallic fins like very thin metal who can which conducts heat very readily absorbs that heat and transfers it to the cool air coming in so it's got a heat exchanger so the warm air going out goes out ends up going out cooler and the cool air coming in ends up coming in warmer and some of these uh hrvs are around 90 95 percent efficient uh, on the higher end of them so that means you're really only losing five to ten percent of your heat out through the wall 
which is quite different than, oh, I need fresh air. We're going to open the windows. Well, what, what's the point of having this tightly sealed envelope if everybody has all the windows open all the time? So this is an effective way of and an efficient way of um, exchanging the air from within the environment. It gets more complicated than that. We get into more things when you do building science related courses. And as I mentioned, I studied this a lot at um, University of Toronto and I had the uh, pleasure of coordinating the building science program. So I learned a lot from that, but um, it does get more complicated, but we do need to understand the basis of our systems. And if we do something, it may cause other issues uh, in the system. Like we said, house is a system. Think of it like uh, humans, right? You've got the skeleton as the structure. You've got the organs um, of the uh, building, which is your building systems. And then you got the skin, which is like your uh, envelope and putting them together. They have to work as an integrated part of each other. So if we tightly seal the walls, uh, then we have to look at, well, how do we bring in fresh air to mean have a healthy environment inside? And this way you can do that. Um, an inefficient house probably has 10 to 15 air changes per hour. So this house that you see me in right now, it has a lot of air changes per hour. It's built in 1960. There's no um, insulation in the walls. It's a solid masonry house. Solid masonry house, uh, very solidly built, will last, you know, uh, I'm sure will last as long as you keep the roof in good maintenance and seal up the joints and things like that will last hundreds of years. Um, but not very good R value, so not very energy efficient. Sure, if the attic's insulated well, the basement will be insulated well, but because uh, it's been redone. But the walls, unless you redo them at some point and you build in the walls and you um, take action, they really won't be. Uh, so that's typical in a lot of um, older houses. Most houses, anything older than 1965, you're not going to find very much insulation in the walls. With that said, you know what? Um, I don't worry too much about moisture getting stuck in the wall. Uh, so we talked about in the previous session, uh, moisture going through air flows into the wall and then it gets stuck there and then maybe it condenses and then maybe it starts to cause rot and mold. I don't worry too much about these walls. It's leaking everywhere and they're brick. So it gets through the wall, it hits the brick you know what, the brick absorbs the moisture and it dries it to the outside. So it it's, it's ventilates it that way. So sometimes then, but it's not practical. It doesn't make any sense today. So we changed our designs, you know, starting in the 70s and everything's been getting tighter and tighter and more higher insulated values. And that's fine, but we just have to make sure that we put things, the assemblies together the right way. So as I said earlier, if moisture gets in, it can dry out. We can bring in fresh air with an HRV so we can have good indoor air quality. So when we change things, it's like a system. We got to adjust things so that the system functions and works properly and um, effectively. So that's uh, a very important part of the building um, science um, process to think about when we're designing because there's a lot more that can go wrong when you got this really tight system and you didn't really design it properly you really didn't install it properly uh, you can set yourself up for some catastrophic issues uh, that could potentially cause um, problems in the building so we have to be much more attuned and smart and understanding about building science principles uh, today than maybe we did 50 60 years ago because we do want to uh, be good global citizens and we want to have energy efficient buildings. Uh, one uh, last thing on, a, on uh, this uh, last um, couple of slides uh, or last slide is um, cocks and sealants. Well, between all our, our joints and assemblies, we have, we want to seal it, right? And so uh, we will generally use some sort of caulk or sealant um, to fill that void. And there's all kinds of different um, sealants on the market uh you know you have elastomeric you have silicons you have a, a lot of different um, types of sealants and different lifespans and some are more appropriate for uh, some materials as compared to other materials but the point that we're using these cocks and sealants is to prevent moisture from ingressing into 
uh, a building. And um, even just how we actually do it uh, can um, make um, sense um, from that perspective. So we're at, we actually, there's a backer rod, a foam backer rod that we put into place, and then the sealant goes against that, and then that'll have a very long lasting um, life from, from that perspective. Generally, it doesn't work too good if actually a sealant is put against three surfaces, like three hardbound surfaces. Usually there's some movement and shrinkage that, shrinkage that you uh, run into. So you try to make sure that it's sealed and you have to understand too that sealants will fail at some point. So that's where maintenance comes in. If you are reliant on a sealant at a certain point, that's probably not the best thing because then at some point moisture will get in. So you want to try and design your systems. Like I said, if moisture gets in, it can get out and you do want to maintain um, the quality of the bonds and the quality of the sealant. So that re generally requires ongoing um, maintenance um, to ensure that that's kept up from that perspective. Uh, I had a friend, a uh, professor at um, University of Toronto named Ted Keswick and uh, when we were working in the building science, uh, area and he always um, he, he was a very funny guy and uh, but very smart and he um, he basically said you know with building science there's there's three wings three things you got to worry about and um, really it had to do with uh, moisture and it was basically a pressure differential between the inside and the outside and temperature gradients like we said cause that pressure differential minus 20 plus 20 and you've got warm trying to move to cold. That's one big issue. If we could get rid of that, that'll, that'll um, uh, solve our problems that we won't have moisture coming in. Um, the other one was gravity. Uh, so water flows and it finds through gravity openings and then it moves through those openings and finds its way um, in um, that way. And that's a, a major problem from a building science perspective. So we have uh, moisture from gravity, moisture from a uh, pres uh, pressure differential, and we have um, moisture from airflow too, right? And if we can, if we can solve uh, that, um, then, or if we can have a perfect seal on our buildings, then we have no problems. The problem is we're not going to be able to solve. Those are all insolvable problems so what we can do though is we can design systems that will allow some issues to happen but the buildings will breathe they'll dry out and they'll be resilient and that's um, generally the best designs that you can have um, when you're um, thinking in those terms if you're relying on a perfect bond or a perfect seal and that's going to be what's holding everything back uh, it might be good in the first uh, first couple of years, but uh, you can be sure at some point moisture will be getting in through it. So these are the challenges that we have in construction. And we've, we've looked at a, a number of um, points in the last couple of lectures and in Chapter 12 of our uh, Understanding Construction Drawings textbook. So if there's stuff that's here that doesn't make sense to you, there's some if information I didn't really cover it in the lecture on glass and thermopane windows, uh, triple pane windows, the more glazing you have, um, the more R value you have, the higher, the bigger the space between the glazing, the thickness of the glazing, those all have impacts on um, the, the glasses resistant to heat loss and U values, uh, which I get into the textbook, but I didn't really get into that too much here. Um, you can read the textbook to see that would be also solar heat gain coefficient and low emissivity, um, but they're both in the textbook, so a new factor. Uh, so uh, that's really what I wanted to get through today. Um, Tom Stevenson wishing you a uh, great weekend and a great evening. As you can tell, it's a weekend that I'm talking about. Uh, so have a great evening. Bye for now.